Um, I'll just open with Katakia. Kia tau mai te mata matanga, kia tau mai te rangi māri e, kia tau mai te kaha me te oroha, aroha, mō tēnei, kou papa, hui e, tai kia. Uh, we have apologies from Deputy Mayor Bryant. So someone like to move the apologies be accepted. Move Councillor Dallas, seconded Councillor Mailing or Councillor Maru. Uh, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against carried. That brings us to public forum. So we have one registered speaker in public forum, so Alison Pickford. Alison, if you'd like to come up to the table, grab one of those microphones, you're welcome to sit or stand over to you. And you've got five minutes. So that's that's quite right. So if you push, hopefully push one of those buttons and the little thing should go red. Yep. And off you go. Okay. Um, I'd like to speak about the long-term plan currently underway. And this also feeds into the climate change submissions and discussions. Um, I don't think you're looking adequately far enough forward. The latest climate reports um, are shocking scientists globally. The Greenland ice sheet melt is in hyperdrive. The average melt from 2017 to 2020 was 20% more a year than at the start of the decade, seven times higher than the annual shrinkage in the early 1990s. The newest data from 2017 to 2020 the combined melt from Greenland and Antarctica soared to 410 billion tonnes per annum, and since 1992, 8.3 trillion tonnes of ice has been lost from these two sites. Ice is responding horrifically rapidly to changing, changing climate. The study scientists described not so much as surprising but really disturbing. The recent rapid heating of oceans sees the... Global surface temperature set this month as the highest over the past 15 years. Earth's accumulated heat has increased 50%. Most of it's going into the oceans, but oceans are increasingly absorbing less CO2 and greenhouse gases. There's also thermal expansion of the water, accelerating glacial melt, coastal flooding, more extreme weather events. The East Antarctic Ice Shelf alone contains 70 metres of sea level rise. We should be considering preparing organised retreat and not using so many resources and so much money and effort so close to the coast. We've already got a massive stranded asset problem looming and a 20 metre rise is locked in, whatever. The Bay of Plenty is already abandoned a village, another in Wales on the Grand Banks that the 20 residents, 20 years residents thought they had, they're now watching their houses being demolished, demolished by the tides. So I think, I ask the council to be responsible ancestors and to reject the time frame of the present current modelling and look at 50 to 100 years. Um, it's really uncomfortable, but we should be looking at what we can do now and not having a hasty forced retreat, which is going to be even cha really chaotic. So I really think that 30 to 50 years is just not adequate. You need to look further forward. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Thank you for coming in and presenting in the public forum. We'll now move on to declarations of interest. Um, any declarations for any items on today's agenda? If not, Thank you. Uh, next in the minutes from the 23rd of March council meeting, someone willing to move the receipt of those minutes, move Councillor Mailing, second to Councillor McKenzie. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against carried. Um, right, that brings us to the first item on the agenda, which is the Councillor Code of Conduct. And Jenny, over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, following the workshop at the beginning of April with Council on the proposed Code and, uh, of Conduct and Policy, um, staff have prepared versions for Council, which are before you with the report. Um, 
I do need to draw your attention to a couple of things in relation to the drafts. Um, there were a couple of things that we brought through from the 2019 code. I think I said at the workshop that there wasn't uh, anything in particular that we thought needed to come through. But once we went into the details of preparing um, the Tasman versions, we decided that we needed to include um, particular clauses. So on page nine, we've included a clause about the relationships with the chief executive and staff. And I should explain that the way the code works is that you've got the commitments there, which formerly were referred to values. And then appendix one is an explanation of some of those um, commitments, it goes into more detail as to what something like respect might mean or bullying or har and harassment might mean. Um, so we felt that in terms of relationships with the chief executive and staff, um, that that clause should be pulled through from the existing code. So we've pulled that one through. We've also included some information about members' obligations with regard to their interests, pecuniary and, and non-pecuniary interests on page 13. And we also included council social, internet and social media guidelines as an appendix, appendix four. And the reason for that is when I looked at the um, social media guidelines in the Local Government New Zealand Good Governance Guide, that's very much about digital harm and, and not quite as focused in terms of members managing their social media accounts. So that's why we've included that. Um, the policy, I, I believe, is fairly self-explanatory. We haven't made any changes to that. That's, as you know, is a, is a new policy managing complaints. In terms of decisions that council needs to make um, prior to adopting the code, uh, if you decide to adopt the code and the new policy, it's suggested that you um, make a decision around the assessment process, whether that should be a one-step process or a two-step process. The two-step process being a complaint would be referred to an initial assessor, independent assessor from council. And if the assessor makes the initial assessment in terms of the validity of the complaint, the level of seriousness and the next steps, which might involve referring that um, to the mayor to handle, marriage and community board chair, or committee chair um, or mediation or refer it to an independent investigator and the investigator would undertake the investigation from there. The next decision that council would need to make is in relation to an independent investigator whether or not their decision should be a final determination, final and binding. At that point once those two decisions have been made then you would be in a position to look at adopting the code of conduct but we need a 75 percent a majority vote of the members present at the meeting and then adopt the policy. In terms of next steps after that, we would finalise the documents and then have discussions with the community boards around their codes of conduct. Happy to take questions. Thank you, Jenny. That's open for questions, comments, moving or seconding. Uh, Councillor Maru and then Councillor Kenan. I think, Mr. Mayor, so I was just a follow up. Um, sure was at the workshop in terms of the reference to the list approved by council rather than the CEO would consider feedback and, um, from the members. Uh, I was really keen for the council to ratify the list. I have no issues with the one that was circulated, but in terms of a, a process where there's an appointment of an investigator for essentially elected members, there's some buy-in and having some comfort on who those investigators are. So I just sort of ask for that consideration in terms of um, recommend, recommendation by the CEO, but approved by council in terms of the list of available investigators was my request, I suppose. Jenny. Um, the LGNZ guidance is very clear that that's a decision for the chief executive. The reason for that is that the investigator would be investigating a member. So you don't normally get to appoint your own jury. You can see what I'm saying. So that's really why it sits with the, the chief executive, but with um, the proviso of consultation with members around that list of, of uh, proposed assessors and investigators. Thank you. It was, it was just the next threshold for me. So having the final and full determination by the assessor, that was the step that would get me to that rather than it coming back. So, that was where I was more comfortable, as if there was some say in that position for then the findings of the investigator to be full and final rather than coming back, because that was my preference that their, their report would be final. 
Jenny. Just to clarify then, Councillor Mara, you were saying that you would rather that the decision of the investigator isn't a final determination, that that report would come back to Council and Council make the final determination? Is that what... It was the other way okay, around with right. the proviso of um, not choosing the judge and jury, but having some input in terms of the the ones available for the preferred, um, I, I guess, the authorised or the accepted list of who those investigators may be. So not, yeah. So, just, so can I just clarify? So I think um, Councillor Marishkin's position is not selecting who might actually do the investigation from the list, but just approving the list overall at the start. And then obviously, in the event of an actual complaint, the selection of the person from the list would be clearly the CEOs. And um, clarification around under the policy as worded, as written, as recommended, is the recommendation of the investigator. Should it get that far, final, or is it recommending coming back to the committee, uh, to the council to make that final decision? I guess that's not following the guidance, um, but there's nothing to, to stop you doing that. We would have to come back with another report um, with the list for that. And it's just about managing perception, uh, I suppose, in terms of, of uh, the, the CE um, approving that list rather than council. Jeanette. Uh, yeah, just to add, from the um, Council Maru's uh, suggestion was what prompted us to both clarify that position around who decides the list of investigators, but also prompted us to send that list around to all councillors. So we we really have been very open to feedback. So I'd like to think that you can feel that you have had the opportunity to influence. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that we actually have now a list that, from the feedback I've had, has suggested that we can maintain that list. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Kinnamont, then uh, Councillor McKenzie. <clears throat> Excuse me, Jenny and Elaine, I see you earlier. No? Yes. Um, on the 20th of April <clears throat> at 3.22pm, I sent you an email and I haven't had a re reply yet. Do you remember receiving that email? It's regarding Appendix 3, Clause 2, Treaty of Waitangi. My apologies, I thought I had replied to that. Um... Because, yes, it was. Uh, I, I'm aware that it went to the chief executive as well, um, and that a response was sent advising that um, it would be up to council to decide today on whether what aspects of the code it wants to keep or, or change. Okay. So, just to clarify for the people in the room here, clause two is the Tasman District Council commits to the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. And yet I believe this code is designed for the members. And I'm suggesting that, uh, take the words Tasman District Council out, or take the clause out, because we're already committed through other policy documents to the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, I don't know where to take this further. Mr. Chairman? Um, well, it, the resolution has to be moved and seconded. Um, so at the moment, it's your suggestion. You, If you wish to move an amendment, you would have, well, you can move a resolution not containing that clause, and you'll have to see if there's a seconder. And if there's a seconder, uh, then we will have to vote to determine whether or not um, your resolution is supported by the rest of the council or nay. I just, I'm not against principles of Treaty of Waitangi and I'm fully in favour of it. It's just the inclusion in this document as well, which I think is focused more at the code of conduct for the members, not necessarily the whole of the Tasman District Council. So I'm would like to see the words change from the Tasman District Council to members commit to the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, to some degree, I suspect that is splitting hairs, but um, 
do you have a view on the difference between members and the Tasman District Council, Jenny? Um, I, I tend to agree um, that there, this maybe had been an oversight. Um, I mean, obviously there are obligations in, in all the various statutes that apply to council, but they do bind council itself, whereas uh, this would be binding for members. So I, I would be happy to, to make that change. Yeah. So it would read the uh, members of or the members commit because don't you have to still include the words because there has to be the members of something unless members is otherwise to, to, to commit as opposed to commits in, in the code of conduct for this year members is described as means of elected and appointed members of so i think we can change take out the words tasman district council and say members will commit to the principles of the Treaty of Waitangi. Happy with those yeah. words. So on that basis, with that amendment, are you happy to move? Yes, that's the process. Yep. That is the process. Yep. Is there a second it before I move on? I've got a number of other speakers, but is someone prepared to second the resolution? Uh, seconded Councillor Shellcress. Uh, I've now got uh, Councillor McKenzie, Councillor Ellis and Councillor Hill. Um, thank you. I just, uh, with respect to Councillor Kinnamont's point, I'm wondering if I could just get some clarification as to where exactly in the document we're referring, because I'm wondering whether if it's the paragraph that I'm looking at, it's actually about context. And so um, I, I just don't want us to be changing something ad hoc on the fly. So I want to make sure I properly understand it. So could I be directed to the actual page that we are um, planning to change, please? Uh, so, Jenny or Mike, uh, Councillor Kennewant. Look, looks out me at the stage. Um, I've got here Appendix 3, Clause 2. I'm sorry, I haven't got the page. In front of me. Page 17. Just to clarify, though, the members' commitments are the main part of the code, and that states that um, members agree that they will operate in a manner that recognises and respects the significance of the principles of Te Tiriti O Waitangi. And then Appendix 1 contains clarification and, and guidance in terms of it, it expands on that in Clause 2. Yeah, it's actually more consistent the way it's worded now yeah. between the two bits. It was an oversight in the template. I agree. Oh, yeah. yep. Uh, Councillor Ellis. Thank you. Thank you through the chair. Um, I'm just wondering, um, when we workshopped uh, the Code of Conduct, um, we did have a discussion regarding things being actioned in a timely manner, i.e. we can't pull something from months back. We need to address things um, earlier in the process. I've been unable to see in the Code of Conduct where we have allowed for that. Um, my recollection is that we, we didn't want to place too many restrictions because you don't know what might come become relevant, relevant sorry, um, at a point now that relates to something that happened in the past. So it's, it's, a, it's a code that you would adopt that would, would apply from now onwards until another, it's amended or, or changed to this particular triennium, um, but it doesn't prevent someone raising an issue that might relate to something um, that happened a while ago. But I mean, yeah, again, it, it would be possible to include something to the effect that there's a, I don't know, a 12 month limitation period, something like that. But it, it's not common practice or, or best practice in, in the sector to do that. I've never come across a code that has got any kind of restrictions like that. Um, 
uh, Councillor Hill. Uh, thank you. Can I just stop by saying, could we please have the chat function um, allowed here? Um, if, if we have issues technically, it's difficult to let you know about them. So Celia's been in touch with me. It's corrected now for her, but um, it's much easier just about to send a message through to Robin or whoever's there to say, can't hear or something's wrong. So um, I've got a request there. Um, I'm, I'm struggling to follow along here a little bit. <clears throat> I can see perhaps there's an amendment on the screen up there. Is that to the resolution or to the document? Um, if that could be screen shared, that would help us a lot. Um, and I just missed the um, the point of the change between Tasman District Council and members and exactly where that is in the document. I was listening, but I couldn't quite uh, pick that up. I don't Can understand yeah. the point of it. <clears throat> So do you just want to run through the two locations? So the one that um, was raised by um, Councillor Kinnamont to make a change and the other reference, which already re uh, already references members. So the there's a reference in the members' commitment, which is part one of the Code of Conduct. In the members' commitment, section four there relates to the, the principles, treaty principles. And then on the, it's page six of the code itself, in appendix one, section two, it states at the start there that Tasman District Council commits to operating in a manner that recognizes and respects the significance of the principles. The proposal is that that is amended to members commit to operating in a manner that recognizes and respects on the basis that this code of conduct applies to members and is about members' commitments and, and behaviours and isn't relating to council itself as a whole in the way that um, council has obligations under legislation in terms of its treaty obligations. Hopefully that clarifies it for you, Councillor Hill. Um, and members don't have those obligations. If there was a, a breach, action would be taken against council um, as an organisation, as a whole, um, a breach of legislation, whereas with the code, this is an agreed um, standard of behaviours and, and, and conduct between members, so it would be appropriate for it. If, if there was a breach of the code, that's a matter for members. Uh, so there's no disadvantage to making the change? There's no... Um... No, it's, 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 no. it's more appropriate to have have members and in line with, with what's in part one of the code. Uh, okay, thank you. Councillor Silligrini. Well, good morning, thanks. Um, yeah, I've got a few issues and concerns. Um, so I'll just step through them and forgive me if I try and do this in a simple way, but I think there are some technical issues in here that um, need to be thought through. So we're, we're invited to adopt uh, the 2023 code uh, to replace our recently, only three years ago, 2019 uh, code. And I must admit, um, initially reading through the code in the workshop papers, it looked pretty much the same. But as I spent more time uh, looking through this document, um, I've noticed some interesting changes. Um, LGNZ, who I've approached, have tried to reassure me that it has changed nothing from the 2019 code and that the code still remains aspirational. But I think some of the tinkering that has been made between the 2019 code and the 2023 code um, has made changes, albeit probably unintended changes. Now, I appreciate that um, when the 2019 code was introduced, I also raised some concerns. And to Council's credit, it paused the introduction of that code so that they could be further explored before adoption, which I think is prudent here as well. Uh, I'll make some observations for myself. Um, it's been interesting watching this code uh, over the lifetime that I've been here, and there are many councillors who have been here uh, far longer than probably twice as long as I've been here, but during my time, I've certainly seen this code 
virtually double in size uh, since I've been here, uh, which is quite an incredible uh, situation, given it's supposed to just provide a simple code of conduct uh, around meetings. Um, my observation is that council is a creature of statute. So you cannot impose any higher standards on council or councillors than set by law. And essentially, uh, the code uh, was used to summarise established legal principles around conduct and, I suppose, um, make them understandable in a simple way um, for councillors to understand and adopt in their, in their um, treatment of fellow councillors and council staff. But my concern is that uh, this code is essentially attempting to micromanage councillors. And I raised these concerns in 2019, and I think they're beginning to play out. So my concern is that some, not all, but some of the changes in the 2020 code versus the 2019 code are not supported by law and are, in terms of LGN's Ed's wording, more aspirational than lawful. And I'm keen uh, not to be front of pack on this code, given all the very subtle changes that I do not think have been properly thought through by LGNZ when it's recommended this code. And certainly uh, from the discussions I've had with LGNZ, um, I haven't received any reassurance uh, that this code is actually compliant with the law. What they've said is it's... Um, it's aspirational mark and it's a very high benchmark and it hasn't changed since 2019. Um, I'm happy to go into detail, but I think um, it's going to get very technical. But um, I think uh, we either pause this and have a bit more of a chat. Um, Mike's already raised changes that I think open up a whole new can of worms, um, given uh, LGNZ have recommended this and we really haven't um, actually tested legally uh, where some of these changes are going. But I think um, we should be probably, uh, given I don't want to be front of, front of pack on this code, uh, adopting the 29 code, which LGNZ reassures me hasn't changed. This code hasn't changed since 2019, so why don't we just adopt the 2019 code and then wrap around uh, the proposed processes uh, that has been suggested by staff. So, Mike, um, I'm suggesting uh, if you want to withdraw uh, your moving of this motion. Um, I'm happy to move um, that we adopt the 2019 code and wrap around the processes. Um, that code is settled. We haven't had any issues with it. Um, uh, and I think it's better structured than the one that we've, that's been currently put before us. So um, if Mike doesn't want to withdraw um, his motion, uh, then I suppose I'm forewarning um, that I'll move that the 2019 code be effectively rolled over um, and that the processes that have been proposed are wrapped around it. Okay, thank you, Councillor Greening. I'll just check uh, with Councillor Kinnamont whether he wishes to withdraw his uh, motion. I need help and guidance. Uh, well, I can only provide you help and guidance to the extent that I'm asking you the question. Yeah. Uh, you, you've got a motion that's been moved and seconded. Um, the only way that can be uh, changed um, is either by amendment or, as Councillor Greening has correctly chosen to do, foreshadowing that should the resolution be lost, he will move an alternate resolution. Um, so it's a, it's a very simple question. Um, and I would have thought a fairly simple answer if you were prepared to move it in the first place, but it's over to you. I withdraw the motion. Thanks, Mark. Um, I'd like to move that the 2019 code be adopted in the processes that are proposed are wrapped around it. So before I come, is there a seconder? So the motion lapses for want of a seconder. Is someone prepared to move another resolution? 
Councillor McKenzie. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm prepared to move as originally uh, put forward. Thank you. Moved, Councillor McKenzie. Is there a seconder for that resolution? Moved, Councillor Maley. So it is now moved as per the recommendation contained in the agenda. So for clarity, that means the wording that Councillor Kinnamont suggested changing is changed back. Just so that motion is now open for uh, comment, feedback, questions. Councillor Greening. Yeah, so I'm going to raise the concerns I just raised before, and I thought, so so I, you, uh, I hope you're not going to repeat exactly uh, what you said before because you've already no, no, said no, it. No, no, but um, I do want to highlight that there are some changes in here that I I don't think. Um, are intended, I appreciate, and I've had a conversation with LGNZ recently about this. Um, they reassure me that there's nothing changed, but when you actually compare the provisions and I look at the values proposition, which I think was raised earlier, and you look at the new provision in the 2020 um, uh, code, uh, there is changes. Uh, they have moved things around and um, I don't necessarily agree uh, with what they've done because I think that has changed potentially um, how the code will apply. So um, I, I don't think we, uh, if you're referring to conversations you've had with LGNZ that we're unaware of, um, yes. if there is, if there's correspondence or specific information that you've received from LGNZ, um, then, then clearly we're happy for you to share that with us. Um, but in the absence of that, it's a bit difficult for us to take like okay, well, a, a um, second-hand well, conversation if you want to be specific <laughs> about the clauses you're concerned about. Yeah. Um, so feel, um, feel free to be so. Yeah, yeah. So I, I pointed out the values uh, uh, provision. So that, that, that's where they've been tinkering and moving things around. Um, in the previous 2019 version, those values were stated as interpretational aids. Um, but that, that wording has disappeared. And, um, and certain values and um, behaviours that were listed in, in that provision um, uh, have also been moved around, which may 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 change their application. They don't. They don't. They LGNZ suggest that that, that was not intended, um, uh, but then they haven't really explored it because I've only just recently raised it with them. Um, um, correspondence has been with me and Janine, so Janine's aware of it as well. Um, and their response was it was uh, it was all aspirational. And if it's supposed to be aspirational, and I think there may have been some changes that they may not have intended. Right. So, um, so Janine, given you have had the correspondence, are you happy to share the correspondence, the questions and the answers that LGN have provided to us for clarity? Uh, yes, uh, through the chair. So, um, Councillor Greening, your queries were around common law um, and interpretation around um, equitable contribution, I believe, as well as other areas you'd raised in your email. The um, Mike Reid from Local Government New Zealand did reply to that and he replied, it's not actually a new position, um, and this was around the equitable contribution, as it was added in the 2016 or 2019 redraft and doesn't appear to have caused any issues. In terms of your general point, almost all of the code is aspirational as it sets out behaviours that members agree to act in accordance with, and the redraft was a response to concerns of the lack of any mechanism to address cases of members who might not be pulling their weight. However, it is a template, and our advice is that councillors use it as a basis for discussion and adopt those that they feel comfortable with. So, okay, thank you. Point, so, my point uh, is... So, Councillor Greening, so if you could... Yes, I'll give you the opportunity to complete uh, your speaking, and now I need to move on to Councillor Murray. Yep. So my point is that the principles were there in 2019, uh, but they were positioned around um, interpretational aids, and, and that has changed. So um, they don't think it has. They think it's still a high bar, it's still aspirational, and uh, the 2020 code shouldn't have changed anything. I think it has. 
Um, hence why I thought, well, we might as well just introduce the 2019 code and wrap around the processes, because that's really, I think, the processes which are the focus. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. That's basically um, the sense of it. And uh, so we're a creature of statute, so we can't impose higher thresholds than the law. And I think, I think with some of the tinkering that's gone on by removing like aids to interpretation, they have effectively, potentially, um, been interested to see what their legal advice was, because I certainly asked for it and they couldn't provide it, um, uh, which makes me think that maybe there has been some tinkering and they haven't actually backed it with um, some legal advice. Um, uh, that they could be opening a whole new can of worms, and um, yeah, and I don't want to be front of pack uh, when that happens because it'll probably be litigation. Thank you, Councillor Greening. Councillor Murray. Thank you, Mr. Bear. Um, I'll be voting in favour of this. I think um, I have no issues of being held to account to a higher asp aspirational standard um, than any member of the public. So I think, in terms of the aspiration of respectfulness and um, actually doing service to the community as well. I was support. I'm disappointed that we didn't have um full motion though, Mike. It could have tidied up a word that was actually quite important, but I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you, Councillor Murray. Councillor Hill. Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> um, uh, uh, is our CEO or um, Jenny is advising us um, able to identify anywhere in the in the in the code where we've got a higher threshold than the law. Jenny. So the local government act requires councils to have a code of conduct. So that's where there is the legislative um, imperative, if you like, to have a code. What the act says needs to be in a code is that it should set out the understandings and expectations adopted by the local authority about the manner in which members may conduct themselves while acting in their capacity as members, including behaviour towards one another, staff and the public, disclosure of information, and it should also include an explanation of legislation, which we've included. Now, the act isn't prescriptive in terms of what those um, understandings and expectations are or behaviours that should be included. Um, and so to assist the sector for years, LGNZ has provided a code which has generally been picked up and used by council. I uh, agree though that there has been a change in wording in terms of the values in the 2019 code. There is a, uh, a note at the bottom of them where it says that these are these values are intended to provide general guidance and an interpretive aid for the rest of the code. They complement and work in conjunction with the principles of the Local Government Act. Um, whereas with the, the new template, they've, the values are now called commitments, and it states that these commitments apply when conducting the business of the local authority as its representative. So there has been a, a subtle shift um, in terms of uh, the wording, but at the end of the day, it's still the councillors who are agreeing to these um, aspirational behaviours and commitments. Um, they're not underpinned by legislation itself. The code is, and what you decide to put into the code. Thank you, Jenny. Um, uh, thank you. And when I look at the, the commitments, uh, there's nothing in there that I look at it and think, oh, Lordy, how am I going to manage that? Yeah. Uh, or um, uh, how dare anyone think we should be, um, you know, behaving in these ways? These are fairly basic uh, principles that we need to function by. And um, I'm certainly supportive of them. And, you know, I have experience in my first term at council uh, you know, feeling very, very uncomfortable uh, with some some behaviour, and uh, you know the way the ways in which that can be managed aren't easy. So, if I was to become a bully and to harass people, um, you, you know, you know, it's, there's not a, it's, <laughs> I I know that it's not a, a simple process just to say, look, Chris Hill, stop bloody doing that, you know. So this is a really serious matter. And um, a part of it's warm and nice, isn't it? I'm going to treat all people fairly. 
got to be respectful, all those things. But uh, at the pointy end of this, uh, it's a really, really serious matter, which some of us have, you know, had some experience around. So um, I, I have no objection at all to the commitments, and I'll certainly uh, take that on. And um, I appreciate the amount of work and effort that's gone into this. I couldn't make the workshop. I had something happening with family that I couldn't get there. So um, I'm, I don't like being in a position where I'm commenting on something I haven't contributed to at a workshop, but I appreciate those that have and all the work that's gone in here, uh, Jenny and, and other staff members to uh, give us um, something that's sound and that we can uh, trust that we can rely on. I'll be, I'll be supporting uh, the resolution. Thank you, Councillor Hill. Are there any further comments in relation to the resolution? Councillor Greening. Yes, yeah, so I just want to uh, reinforce the fact that I'm, I'm not raising uh, concerns about any of those issues because those principles uh, which uh, Councillor Hill has raised were in the 2019 version. Um, what I'm raising is a technical issue around the change in some of the language. And importantly, as raised by staff, this code of conduct is supposed to address conduct to one another. And I think uh, the 2022 code has crept outside of that. Okay, thank you, Councillor Groening. Um, so, look, I think ultimately uh, the code of conduct is in part about our behaviour towards one another, but it's also just about our behaviour in general. Um, and the way that we interact within um, the community, in public, on so all of those things are covered. And the commitments, um, again, uh, taking Councillor Hill's point or, and um, other speakers, there's, there's nothing in there that leaps out as me as something that shouldn't be a commitment. Um, and I acknowledge the slight change around the wording, and I think the word commitment is actually a better um, reflection of what what we do. I mean, ultimately, as Jenny pointed out, this is a decision that we make for ourselves. We're required to have a code of conduct. What's in it is up to us to decide. And what we have in front of us um, is the suggestion based on the conversations, obviously the guidelines, guidance and template created by all Gen Z, but also the, um, the discussion at the workshop. So look, I'm more than comfortable. I think if I look around um, in my time in local government, uh, the decisions that we make are always going to be debated. People have different opinions. I think what everyone expects um, of their representatives, whether that's their national representatives in parliament or their local representatives at councils, is that the way they behave, the way they debate issues, the way they interact both uh, in the chamber or are between each other and publicly, um, they just expect a good standard of behaviour. So I, I just don't see the, any of the issues that have been raised being... Um, ones of significance. So, look, I'm happy to support the resolution um, as worded. Uh, Councillor Butler, Councillor Kinnamont, and then I'll come to Councillor McKenzie for a right of reply. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, you know, having listened to the discussion, um, I, I, I think that the, the cutting edge is really around social media um, because that's the, um, you know, that's the, um, the area of our um, social intercourse, which is changing all the time and changing very, very rapidly. So for me, um, you know, the most important thing is is, is the, um, you know, the appendix on the, um, the appendix on social media really going to um, provide what's necessary. And for me, it does. And so for the rest of it, I'm I'm happy to support it. I do. I do understand that, um, you know, that there may be some little changes that may have crept in, but I'm happy with the commitments as opposed to values. So um, I'll be supporting it. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Butler. Uh, Councillor Kinnamont. Through the Chair, uh, <coughs> Councillor Green, would you be accepting of this in its current format for the next three years with a review within the three years? Is it that serious that it's going to impinge on the way we all work around here? So my question to you would be... So, so just so just to be clear, so when you're speaking, so if you just speak to all of us, 
as opposed directly to Councillor Greening. Uh, so it's not a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So. You, you can continue. Oh, just your microphone not working now. <laughs> I didn't switch it off, by the way. Just in, case, in case anyone's wondering. Um, sorry about that little gaff there, um, members, councillors. Um, my question is to Councillor Greening that um, given that what's in front of us is for a three-year period, could he see his way to agree to accepting it with a view of in three years' time we change it. Um, to me, around the table seemed to be a general agreement that we're heading in the right direction, but maybe Councillor Greeny could have an input through the next three-year period of um, improving it. I think Councillor Greening has made his position pretty clear. Um, given you've asked him the question, Councillor Greening. Um, through the chair. Um, uh, th this has come up, changed from 2019, um, and no doubt will change again at the next term as uh, Project LGNZ are trying to uh, show their contribution to the local government sector uh, through these changes. My concern is the tinkering that's gone in it, which I don't think has been well thought out by LGNZ with all the best aspirations and intent in mind. Um, I think. Um, uh, the equal uh, participation clause as well, you know, wonderfully aspirational, does open up many doors. Um, you know, um, I know they've worded it as a high bar um, uh, by the language that they may have used, and therefore there is no change from 2019. But I do find it odd that they've moved this particular provision out of um, the commitments, which was just a rebrand of values, um, and has accidentally or intentionally, it's not clear, but LGNZ were unable to give me an answer um, on how this is to be used in interpretation approach. Their, their indication is the approach um, hasn't changed and in this, uh, this particular provision, which I raised as an example of one example of change, the equitable uh, contribution uh, provision, which interestingly, you know, one could raise as well, you know, I didn't get that chair role and it's not an equitable um, uh, allocation of my workload uh, for council and then suddenly you got everyone challenging everyone else for roles, which I don't think is intended. Um, but you could read that into this provision. Um, uh, and again, I say that the, the purpose of this stuff is to, con to control conduct between councillors. And we have an instances, this provision has never been used because Quite frankly, I can't see how it could be um, uh, against uh, against anyone. But um, in terms of the question about review, um, uh, I'm object, I'm object, I'm object, I am objecting to the, the the subtle changes that have occurred here because I don't think they've been thought through. Um, and okay. uh, given that the values are the same as the twenty version. <laughs> I think you have very uh, clearly outlined your position uh, in several times. I just want to clarify the point that you've made several times now um, about this is about behaviour between members. So it, that is part of it, but I'll read from the uh, document. The Code of Conduct sets standards for the behaviour of members towards other members, as you've correctly pointed out, staff, the public and the media. So it is broader than just a code that covers yes. the relationships between members, just for clarification. And, and this is a creature so, of statute, and you need to so read the will, legislation which the staff have provided. Come and across the code to is supposed to be about conduct her right of reply. Thank you, Councillor uh, Green. Thank you very much. Um, I think Councillor Maru expressed it uh, expressed it really well. Actually, um, I think that. You know, at the end of the day, if we have to consume um, ratepayers' resources on exploring whether we have or we have not um, complied with the code of conduct, then I actually don't think that we are serving the ratepayers particularly well. Um, I have no problem with it being aspirational or setting a, a high bar. I think that that's, uh, that's actually what our ratepayers would expect. Thank you. Thank you. I'll put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Against. 
uh, the resolution is carried. Right, uh, amendments to standing orders. Jenny and Elaine. Not, is it not working? Okay, so um, yeah, so a couple of fairly basic amendments to standing orders. One's fairly retrospective in the fact that we stopped doing hard copy minute books quite a while ago because the legislation changed, but we didn't update our standing orders accordingly. And the other was to put some protocols in place for if we are changing a workshop time to suit the business of the day. So. There are benefits in not keeping elected members hanging around, but we've identified the steps that we need to go through if we are going to change a workshop time to ensure that staff, elected members, ELT are all aware and can all attend the changed workshop time. Okay, thank you. So pretty straightforward and simple. Councillor Bowler, happy to move. Is there a seconder? Councillor Kinnan wants, are you sure this time? <laughs> moved and seconded is there any comment feedback or questions if not i'll put the resolution all those in favor please say aye, aye. against carried uh the next item is the significance and engagement policy briley welcome good morning um, so significant and engagement policy, um, we've got a date, a review date in the policy to review it every three years. Um, uh, we've done an internal review. Um, we have, we're not recommending any major amendments, um, apart from signalling some changes that we expect will be needed to the schedule of strategic assets. Um, just a, another minor amendment, the policy review date should actually be today's date, the 27th of April, so resolution 2. Uh, has been amended there to be dated 27th of April. Um, could we brought this, this report to this meeting instead of last week's? Other than that, I'll take it as read and um, any questions. Thank you, Briley. Uh, again, open for questions, comments, uh, and or moving and seconding. Councillor McKenzie. Thank you, happy to move. Is there a seconder? Councillor Maru. Are there any comments? Councillor Greening. Thank you. I was wondering if uh, staff could explain the meaning and intent uh, of paragraph 4.13. Sorry, uh, that relates to the holding company. Friday. Uh, so I guess it's signalling that that um, holding company has been established and we expect that that would change the strategic, strategic assets. So is that is that what this is about in terms of realigning um, our significance with a shift of assets that we would have control over or consider significant into the holding company? Is that what it is? This is what I've been advised, yes. Yes. So, so, so just out of interest, if, if the holding company or the sub-company of that disposed of any assets which are on our significance register, but would be removed from our significance register, what's the implications of that? Alan, do you want to, um, bro, bro, Riley, I'll seek assistance. So I suspect this relates to us selling our share or share thereof of the company as opposed to the company selling assets. But, Alan, have you got some advice? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. You, you've summarised it nicely. Yes, it is about yes us disposing of the companies or parts of the companies rather than what what they do in terms of disposing of assets within their, their statement of intent with the council. Right. Does that clarify so the situation, Councillor Greening? So does that mean that that if previously, before this change, 
if there was any disposal, it would trigger something for council to react to it. And with this change, we don't have that trigger. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor. No, so I mean, the, the, the previous policy referred to the, the the port and the airport separately, and it was about whether we, you know, if we chose to dispose of those, the process we would have to go through to do that. Um, this now recognises the holding companies being formed, and and it's a, a, the same issues for the holding company. If we determined decided or the council wanted to dispose of the holding company, it would still again it's about the procedure we would have to go through to, to enable us to do that. So, what, but under the current one, it's about the airport and port, not the holding company, which is a new entity. So, rather than and if the holding company chose to dispose of parts of the airport or port, would that trigger council's reaction? My understanding is under the current process would, because we don't have the holding company in place and there's a direct relationship to those airport and port assets. But um, through the holding company, if the holding company chose to dispose of those sub assets, not of itself, would that trigger a, a need for council to be involved or is council now more distance from it and it's not triggered? We have no ability to prevent it. Yeah, not sure. Don't I don't yeah, I don't think so. I mean certainly what we're proposing here is is that the the strategic asset listed is the shareholding in the holding company. Uh and you know that's effectively what would trigger the the process the yeah, they, I mean Councillor Green's question is an interesting one. I suspect it is covered in the other documentation around the creation of the holding company, but I can't I don't know that for a fact. Um so Councillor Greening's point is should the holding company or could the holding company uh sell effectively the port? Uh my my strong suspicion is it can't, but I suspect it's not the significance and engagement policy that is the place where that is outlined. But it is a question that probably an answer could be provided to post this discussion. Yeah, my, yeah, and that's exactly my concern. Is my concern is that um, yeah, if we sell half the holding company, yeah, that triggers significance. But it's but that, that, that that's just a holding entity. A real asset is the port in Nelson, which is now a little bit more distant, and um, and just making sure that those are still considered significant assets rather than the holding company itself. Yeah, so, so I think that's a, a, a good question that um, Alan can come back with an answer as to how that link is made and through what documentation and what agreements uh, between the holding company, et cetera, because uh, that is a point. Yeah, yeah. so you can, can do that. I don't have that information to hand, but yes, so you can do that. Are the, so subsequent question, are the port and the airport still listed as significant assets? Because I think that would, so if, it, if, it's, if the port and the airport are not listed and the holding company is in replacement, that's one thing. I think Councillor Greening's question is less significant if actually the holding company is now listed as well as the port and the airport. It would be the shareholding and the holding company. But I'm not, it's not my area of expertise. Okay. Um, it's probably unfortunate we, Mike isn't here. We may, uh, yeah. Not sure. So yeah, I think Tim made um, an interesting point, which is uh, it should be a, bit of a fair answer. Is the port or airport still in our significance list, or is it being removed? Yes, they're the ones that are required by legislation to be included. So they are still in our significance list. And Any equity securities held by the local authority in, in a port company? This is it's defined above in the sentence, the clause above. Just that we don't hold those interests anymore. We hold them through. Yeah, so, the so just so I'm just reading on page 74. So for Tasman District Council, the list of strategic assets are shareholding in Port Nelson Limited, shareholding in Nelson Airport Limited, land of buildings, blah blah blah. So this is, I presume. So where does the holding company come in? Does it come into that list? So if it's added to because we no longer have a shareholding in Port Nelson and Nelson Airport. We have a shareholding in the airport company who owns those two. So I think it's an important thing to clarify. Yeah, I think. We, we, we could remove resolution five. Um, and when the actual transfer occurs, include that the amendment to the significance financial policy along 
I, I just think there's confusion here. And I think, you know, if you if you're not clear in here, then then how does the general public see that? So I just wonder if is there a rush on could we bring this back to another meeting? Yeah, I think that's probably the, the best course of action for us. Yeah. Okay. I just think we need to be 100 percent clear on that. So good questions raised. Thank you. Good questions. Thank you, Councillor Greening. So um, I just need a resolution that this matter lie on the table. Uh, Councillor Dowler, seconded. Councillor Ellis, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against carried. Thank you. Um, 8.4, workshop briefing material and released information summary. Jenny Elaine. Either, both, one. The other. Um, so, so this is an information report. It's the first one um, that's actually come to you, which is why we're talking to it. And we don't intend it to um, raise any discussion. It's purely a mechanism to get the workshop and release material out in the public arena. Um, we're not obliged to do so. So we're being proactive in this space. For the ones that remain confidential, we've been asked by staff to keep them as confidential, but should we receive a Lagoima request for any of that material, then the confidentiality or the reasons for withholding would be reviewed as part of the Lagoima request in the future. Okay, thank you for that explanation, Councillor Mayling. I'm happy to move and I support this because it makes us more transparent for our community and our ratepayers. Thank you, is there a second there? Happy to second. Uh, seconded Councillor Greening, thank you. Is there any further comment? If not, all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against, carried. Right, at this point, I think we'll take a quick break for 10 minutes and we'll reconvene. There's some procurement decision making. Uh, Jenny. Thank you, through the Chair. And the primary purpose of this report is to approve some slightly amended terms of reference for Council's tenders uh, slash procurement panel, and also ratify some decisions that the panel's made since the start of the triennium um, around four contracts. There has been an addition there to the resolution, which you'll see up on the screen. Um, I thought it was appropriate that we should actually state in relation to each of those contracts who they'd been awarded to, if they'd been awarded, and what the contract value was. So we've included that in the resolution to ratify those decisions. In terms of the amendments to the terms of reference, um, we the, the uh, panel has the authority to uh, approve uh, award contracts and approve tenders in excess of, of a million, or also to... Um, deviate from Council's procurement policy or procurement strategy. And we've just added in some uh, wording there around appropriate reasons that exist for that deviation. So it's giving them the ability to go outside of Council's policy and strategy, which obviously guide decisions made by Council uh, within their financial limits. And the other change was uh, to remove reference to the decision being by consensus, because that's not in line with standing orders where you would need a majority decision. So those are the changes to the terms of reference. And then, as I say, the only other um, matter is to ratify the decisions that have already been made by the panel. From Going forward from here, the uh, requirements of the Local Government Act and LAGOIMA will be met in terms of meeting processes for the panel. Um, and I think they propose to hold meetings before the operations committee meeting in the morning so that they will deal with award tenders at that point. Happy to take questions. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, Councillor Greening. Um, all of the observations being made earlier, but it would be useful if when we're putting stuff on screen that it's displayed on screen for those who are assessing the meeting remotely. Thank you very much, it would be most useful. Thank you. Um, I also have a question, uh, which I'll put out while I read that, um, which is about 4.5. Um, it says that the panel have not fully complied uh, with LGA and council standing orders. I was just wondering if you could be uh, outline what we weren't compliant with and noting that you are signaling 
um, public notices, agendas, reports, and minutes uh, be recorded. So are you suggesting that all of those things that are being addressed were the things that were not addressed? And were there any others? So I can confirm that the panel held meetings. Um, staff prepared a report in the form of a memo for those meetings. Um, covering the evaluation process for the tenders and making recommendations just as they would with a council report. Decisions were then made by the panel and reported back to the operations committee. What's been missing is, is providing a public notice um, of the meeting and then preparing an agenda and having minutes after the meeting. So there is a, a provision in the Act which says that uh, not meeting those meeting requirements doesn't invalidate the decisions made at those meetings, um, but it is it needs to run similar to a council committee because it is a subordinate decision making body of council. The confusion I think arose with it being called a panel rather than a committee, and it's been an oversight that there hasn't been uh, the formality of uh, the way committees are run with agendas, public notices and minutes, but that's going to be addressed going forward. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, someone prepared to move. Uh, Councillor Mailing, is there a seconder? Councillor McKenzie, anything further? If not, those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Uh, community board discretionary funding. Jenny, it's been a busy day for you, hasn't it? Yeah, it certainly has, thank you. But this is my last report <laughs> this morning. Um, this report relates to a proposed council policy for the community board's discretionary funds as part of the funds allocated um, to the community boards, which primarily come from a targeted rate. They allocate uh, a certain amount from that fund as a discretionary fund, which they use to support community initiatives and projects and also some board functions. So earlier this year, the Motueka Community Board was looking at reviewing the policy and the criteria that applied to them at that point. Um, seemingly, they had a discretionary fund for some period before Golden Bay also, Community Board also had a fund. Um, but Golden Bay Community Board uh, had some criteria in relation to their fund. So it was proposed that we prepare a combined policy that applied to both boards, which we've done. And that policy is based on the previous um, policy that uh, was there for the Motueka Community Board. And that policy contains some generic criteria that both boards are happy with, and then some specific criteria that each board have requested. This has gone to um, both boards at two meetings. Um, so they've had time to consider the, the policy and the criteria and make this recommendation to council. Okay, thank you. So the resolution is there. Is someone prepared to, it's open for conversation, discussion or otherwise. Uh, someone prepared to move, Councillor Amaru. Is there a seconder? Uh, Councillor Walker. Are there any further comments or questions in relation to the item? If not, ah, Councillor Green. Just a few. Um, just first of all, um, looking at the policy, Para 3 review of this policy it alludes to a five year leave review or where the community boards have requested a review. Um, just wondering why it's five years and not matching to the term of council. I thought every new council may want to peer into the policy and either stamp it or um, change it. So I'm just wondering why it was five years and not three years. Um, that's question number one. Question number two just relates to paras five and six um, and the difference between Mochuaka, which has a 700 maximum threshold for 12 months implementation versus Golden Bay, which has a $500 maximum in six months uh, completion. Um, I don't understand why there is a difference in the completion timing or the value of the money. Jenny, two questions. Um, in relation to the first question, uh, the policy is a, is a discretionary policy of, of council, so it's not a legislative requirement to have a policy, so there's no specific um, 
review period in terms of the legislation. Review periods do vary. Um, some things like council's governance statements, you have to review every triennium. Um, some things like bylaws are either every five years or every 10 years. So it's it's a, a term that the boards have uh, chosen to have as a adequate for a five yearly review. Um, certainly that's a, a decision for council to make as to whether it considers it's appropriate. In terms of the individual um, criteria for each of the boards around the maximum amount for applications and the time period for the projects to be completed, those are uh, specific criteria that the boards requested and it, potentially the, the councillors who sit on those boards might be able to provide a little bit more explanation around the decisions for those if required. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Butler. Um, yeah, I, I think um, just speaking on behalf of the Golden Bay Community Board, uh, it's a smaller, Golden Bay is a smaller district. Uh, they, their projects um, 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 are less, um, more likely to be uh, more modest and it was just felt it was a decision by the community board that they wanted to have the lower amount of 500. So, um, you know, if you want, the, it's all, there are minutes which would um, give information about how that how they came to that decision, but it, it really is just um, a reflection of the different community. Okay, thank you. Anything uh, to add from Motueka? Uh, Councillor Murray? Thank you, Mr. Ben. No, nothing to add, but just um, highlighting that the, the, rec the, the motion is as I'm on screen in case the people on, this, um, on Zoom can't see it. Okay. No, happy with the motion. Okay, thank you. I will put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against carried. Which draws us to the next item, a six monthly review of levels of service. Neil. Koto, uh, so just noting that this report is uh, it's a little late. It's a six monthly review of levels of service uh, from July last year to the end of December. I was supposed to go to the last meeting, but uh, it got, got pushed back. Uh, so the general story is that, that we're doing generally better than in, in previous periods and in previous six monthly reviews. Uh, and just noting a mistake in the summary, it should say 14 targets, not 11 targets for the one that we have not met. And uh, with that, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions and there'll be members of ELT floating around who should be able to help in as well. Okay, thank you now uh, for the introduction. It's open for comments, questions, or there's a resolution um, to receive. Uh, Councillor Green. Happy to receive the report. Um, if you need a mover, I'll move. It's received. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Groney. Is there a seconder for the report's receipt? Uh, Councillor Kinnamont. All those in. Ah, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm rushing. Uh, is there any further comments or questions that anyone has in relation, uh, Councillor Mailing? Just when I read this report and I, I looked at some of the um, performance measures, there were some we'll never be able to meet. And I think that's something we just need to note. Um, it doesn't matter how aspirational we are, we'll never be able to meet some of them. And I just wonder, if, you know, if it's appropriate to still have them at some stage. But that's a, a question for another meeting. Mm. But I just note that it doesn't matter how hard we work and how efficient the staff are, we will never meet all of them. More of a comment than a question. Uh, thank you. Councillor McKenzie. Um, thank you very much. I mean, this might be more of a comment as well rather than a question, but I mean, okay, it's it's late and and getting the report. I I accept that. Um, we could rush over it, but in actual fact, this is an incredibly important report because this is actually what it's all about: is actually delivering these levels of service. Um, in a timely way at the right price to our to our ratepayers. So um, if anything that we wanted to pay a lot of attention to, it actually, you know, it, it should be this. Um, and I guess, um, you know, picking up on um, Councillor Mayling's point, 
um, you can have a hard number and, uh, and and you might not meet it, but sometimes agencies adopt an approach whereas if it's within a percentage of it, then you're deemed to have met it because having a hard number is really, you do set yourself up to fail in that regard, so that might be something that you want to think about. I mean, I guess my question, and, and that you might want to come back to us on this, uh, it would be, uh, so what, what, if anything, are you particularly concerned about with regards to the council's performance for the six months to the end of December? I was say, it's probably a question more for the executive leadership team than for, for those of us who compiled the report. <laughs> so, <laughs> well done. Good save. <laughs> Um, but you know, feel free to you know if you have your own if you have your own view, but feel free to share. No, I, yeah, I, my my fresh eyes view on this is that there's a number of measures in there which are fundamentally not achievable. Um, so I think with the long term plan, this is an opportunity to really revamp and how we actually measure. I, th I think you're absolutely spot on. The first time, thank you for doing this. No, no. <laughs> First time I've sat around a, <laughs> sat around the council chamber and heard an elected members actually going, this is really important because generally it's taken as uh, you know, here's what there is. But I think that I think these are what they are at the moment. I think the the work that you need to do though, or we collectively need to do is actually setting those those measures for the long term plan and actually revamping some of those, actually measure how we're performing as an organization, as you alluded to, so the public knows. And I've looked at, for instance, our customer service stats. We're a high-performing organisation. This doesn't tell that story, you know, right across the board. So uh, I think we accept some of these. And we're getting some clear messages from our uh, from our um, long-term plan um, pre-consultation. You know, roading's a big issue, um, potholes, you know, the usual stuff. But it's pretty minor, uh, not minor, but it's stuff we're hearing that we actually know about. But I don't think we really tell that story right through it. But so the opportunity comes the long term plan, I think. Uh, 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 thank you. And, and I think that it is something that we really do need to think about. I mean, I guess with um, with measures that you put in place, um, sometimes organisations, you know, they can quickly ditch a measure. But that in itself needs to be a very conscious decision because what you do when you ditch a measure is that you lose that trend information over time, and that's incredibly useful. The other thing, of course, is that if you introduce a whole lot of new measures, measurement costs money. And so, um, so it, you know, it, it, it's just so incredibly important. I can't stress that enough. So, yeah. yeah. I, I really applaud you for saying that. Um, We've got a lot of static measures, though, as well, which are, you know, an annual residence review. You know, it's pretty static stuff, so that's some of the conversation we need to have. Thank you, Councillor McKenzie. Councillor Walker. Thank you. Uh, through you, Mr Mayor. Um, uh, John's probably summarised it quite well, really, what I was going to say, but, you know, you look at some of this data, you look at KPIs that, with, that are set... And I question some of it around accuracy because, you know, when I go to the library, it's to attend a meeting, but that's not summarised in our reporting. It's like I walk through the door, so I'm counted as a library user, but do we actually capture that new facility and how many people are attending meetings there? Um, so, yeah, I kind of go, you get this data, what are we doing with it? It certainly needs to feed into the long-term plan. And as uh, Councillor McKenzie has said, we don't want to skim over this stuff because this is what our community are telling us, and that's what we're here for. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Anything further? I think it's a really um, a good conversation. There are a couple of things that kind of jump out, which kind of reflect, I guess, um, one is resource consents, so um, an issue that we're all well aware of. I've never fielded more calls than I have in the last six months or three months, three weeks, over people just ringing me, you know, how long is my consent taking? Um, and and it's, it's just, as it's outlined here, lack of resource, um, it's a massive challenge, um, but it, it is, jumps out of these statistics. And the other one is the water, drinking water. 
which as we all know is subject to a whole bigger conversation in the broader context of um, government reform but you know, there's a lot of red around drinking water um, and again with all the explanations and um, coming back to the point that Councillor McKenzie made around targets or Councillor Mailey made as well around not meeting stuff I think the other thing to avoid is just setting the target so easily you can get 100% of everything because that, that doesn't help either. In many cases, as long as there's a clear explanation as to why you're not meeting, it's actually good to have targets and um, so that are both aspirational um, but also that, that push you as an organisation to constantly improve. Um, it's easy to set a whole lot of targets and measures that, that you can achieve and then you just put out a report card that says, oh, yeah, we've got 100% of everything. Um, that isn't necessarily delivering you the outcomes that, that we want to try and achieve. So um, it is a really good report. It's good to have it updated on a regular basis so that we can kind of see where we're heading and where areas that need focus, um, uh, both from us and obviously from the organisation as a whole. Uh, so, yeah, good report and um, good conversation around it. So look forward to the next one. With that, it's been moved and seconded. So I'll put the resolution. All those in favour, please say aye. Next up, we move into committee. So can I have a mover and seconder? Uh, move Councillor Dallas, seconded um, Councillor Kinnamont. All those in favour, please say aye. Against, carried.